welcome to the October 18th meeting of the Community Preservation Committee. I usually see Brian Adams sitting here, I think for the first time in, I'm told, recorded history. He had to be absent, but he will be back for the next meeting, which will be the uh, uh, public comment section. So we're going to follow the usual agenda that the committee follows, which is first to have general public comment. Uh, then we have some minutes for the committee to review and approve. And a chair's report, but the chair has no report. Uh, <laughs> and then we're going to turn to you and uh, look for pre short presentations from each of the applicants. We're going to go in the order, unless there's some reason you have to change it, of Garfield Avenue, uh, Glendale Road, then Village Hill Apartments, then Sergeant House, expansion and then Catamiel music. So, um, first I'll ask if there's any member of the general public that would like to make a comment. No. Next we'll move to our minutes. Do I have a, a motion to approve the minutes I from don't. the May 17th, 2017 meeting? I move we approve the minutes, May 17th, 2017. Is there any discussion? Second. <laughs> Second, thank you. Any discussion? <laughs> uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? I'm not voting because I've got to abstain. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, there is no chair's report, as I said, so let's just move right on to the meetings with the applicants. Um, so if you could give five to ten minutes and as I think you are probably aware we have roughly two million dollars worth in applications and we have about roughly eight hundred thousand dollars for this round and if we have a second round a second round so that means some hard decisions there's some wonderful applications um, so if you can, it would help us enormously if you could focus on helping us understand really your timing of the need for these funds because we're gonna have to do some prioritizing and we wanna make sure we're, we're funding those that are, it's most timely to fund and we need your help in understanding that. So if you could work that into your presentation, would appreciate that. So if we can start. So I'm Megan McDonough with Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity, and I do not envy you uh, having to make these sort of uh, tough decisions here. Um, I, this, like you said, it's going to be a lot of good uh, projects. So if somewhat, I don't know. Oh, there we go. I'm just getting used to this computer here. Um, so the CPA committee has funded our projects in the past, so you're probably familiar with our overall work that we've been in here in Hampshire and Franklin County since 1989. And our focus is on home ownership because of the uh, deep impact that makes in the lives of the people that we house. Um, you know, studies showing increases in graduation rates, children's health, net family wealth, decreases in children's behavioral problems, reliance on government assistance to asthma, it's, there's really some overwhelming evidence that home ownership can make a lasting impact for generations for people. Um, so really our emphasis is on building with the community, is sort of what makes us unique is this engagement with volunteers in the construction process, as well as our future homeowners doing sweat equity with us. All of those homeowners have to present a housing need, a willingness to partner with us, and an ability to pay an affordable mortgage. Um, so we're very excited to be coming back with a request for a proposal to do something at one Garfield Avenue, which um, I don't know how many of you were on the committee funding the other Garfield Avenue projects that we did, but um, we have built five homes in this neighborhood. It was a, a long partnership with the city to make this happen. A clean up that went on, um, much of it before even my time here with Habitat, but we did this small subdivision 
um, extending the Garfield Avenue, and then we built homes on lots two, three, four, five, and six. Um, we thought we were done there. The city of Northampton sold lot 1A to a private uh, individual who then sold it to another private individual who then designed a home and then decided that she didn't want the land and gave it to us. Um, so it's, it, it's kind of come full circle. So this is the final lot in this development. This is a very small lot and the city of Northampton did a design competition here um, called Small Lot Big Ideas uh, to encourage people to take advantage of the small lots in the city of Northampton because of the very progressive zoning here. There's some little corners where it's suitable to build a house. Um, we are working with one of the architects who um, was the People's Choice winner for in that design competition to design us something that um, will be about a 600 square foot one bedroom home. That's a departure from what we have done in the rest of the neighborhood. We typically build three, four bedroom homes, still modest in size in the uh, 1,000 to 1,500 square foot range. Um, but we took in, uh, undertook in this past year a innovation planning project to say, can we widen the diversity of volunteer driven community built housing in our area? And one of the ways we thought to do that was to say, well, what's the smallest, simplest house we can build that will provide someone with this opportunity to get into home ownership? So we hope this will be a pilot site for us to share what we've learned through that process, interviewing end users, working with community leaders to get input on financing regulations and how that affects uh, sort of building small. And we think that Northampton is a good place to do that because the zoning does allow for things like these small lots. Um, so we, well, we always build homes for people under 60% of the area median income. That's what we sell them for. And then we usually set a minimum income as well because the people who buy our homes need to be able to pay an affordable mortgage. So for because this small home is going to be even, is smaller than we typically do, the floor for the minimum income that someone could earn and still qualify for this house is what someone making full-time minimum wage could earn, um, which I think is pretty unusual to have a home ownership opportunity for someone at that range of the income scale. So that's why we're talking about something very small and simple because we're trying to reach down a little bit further, even for us um, who's serving very low-income people for home ownership. Um, right now, we're building a duplex in Amherst. Um, our fiscal year runs from July 1st to June 30th. So this is a little snippet from a really big planning graph I have of where we're building and um, each of those boxes represents a quarter. So right now we're building in um, Amherst and in Greenfield. And then we hope to um, begin the project I'm gonna tell you about next on Glendale Avenue and then do Garfield Avenue after that. Um, so Right now, the lots on, in, on Glendale and Garfield are the only land that we own that are, is in our pipeline. So we are eager to get started in 2018, which is our fiscal year 2019, because our fiscal year 2019 starts July 1st, 2018. So that's a little bit about the timing. And I don't know if you want to pause and ask questions now I know I've provided written responses on some of the committee's questions uh, before I start talking about our other project. So, so the schedule and the application I think said you were going to do this one first? Yes, the Glendale Road. Uh, yeah. the Gar oh, Garfield is first. Glendale's first. Glendale's first. I'm just looking at the dates that are in the Garfield application. It looks like, did that, that thinking change? I don't think it did. This one shows project complete in November 19, 2019. 2019, that's right. Yep, that's what this shows. So fiscal year 2020 it starts oh. in 2019 mm -hmm. and yeah. then ends in 2020. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I should just use calendar years there. So, it makes more sense. Have this yeah. one, uh, <laughs> so you have this one starting, just to clarify, you have Garfield Avenues. You would, 
would ideally like to start when? In the spring of, uh, so. Yeah, about a year from now. About a year, so about a year. Yeah, no, I know, I need calendar years up there too. So um, uh, <laughs> in spring 2019, um, potentially if we, or we could start earlier depending so did it your schedule is on October 2018 yeah okay I, I apologize for uh, being it's not inconsistent. Very well I think that maybe I um, it was part of our subsequent thinking that to push it back a little bit till after Glendale but we would certainly start it in October if there was any reason we weren't doing Glendale just just curious what thank you for catching that What's your experience with people's incomes rising once they um, come into the, purchase since, the, the homes? Since it's a home ownership opportunity, um, we don't ask them for income information again. They have an affordable mortgage, and if they make their mortgage payments on time, then we don't ask them for their income information again. Uh, the only time we would ask them for it is if we held the mortgage and they were having trouble paying, then we would talk to them about their income. Do you have a, Do you have any kind of anecdotal sense? So, I mean, I we do have. Um, this past year, we sold, uh, one of our homeowners sold their home in Turner's Falls that they had lived in for the since 2009, I believe, um, because they had uh, gained enough income that they felt that they could use the, their equity they built in the house to go purchase a market rate house. Anybody else have any? Questions about Garfield Avenue? Would you like to present on? Did you have something? Yep. Would you like to present on Glendale then? Sure. Thanks. Um, Glendale Road is, there are four building lots that we um, acquired from the city of Northampton. Um, it was part of a larger project to conserve, I think that's a number of. Uh, 50 plus acres the, so the hatched area there is the area that was conserved this um, was a previous site of a 24 lot subdivision that was approved um, where the city of Northampton stepped in to purchase it instead and create this conservation land and then put out an RFP for four building lots uh, our proposal for this project is to start with lots two three and four and to build on lot one at a later time. Lots two, three, and four share a common driveway. So there's some efficiencies to land clearing and infrastructure development and community building because these three homeowners will be sharing a driveway and be part of a, a little cluster of homes. We think it would be nice to be able to build all three of those homes at once. Um, so that's what our CPA application is for. Um, and they, right now, uh, thinking is that we would do this first. Um, sorry about the confusion on the timeline. Um, what part of how we're trying to accelerate our building is but through an innovative partnership with uh, a, a nonprofit in Vermont that has been doing zero net energy mobile home replacements um, with modular homes. Um, so they are uh, really leaders in affordable, simple, zero net energy modular homes. And there's a factory in Vermont where they've um, sold, I think it's upward of 80 homes out of this factory for affordable housing purposes in the state of Vermont. And they've applied for a grant from the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources to bring that program to Massachusetts and have selected us as a pilot site to partner with them in bringing that concept here to Massachusetts. So because our volunteers are so critical and the concept of getting sweat equity is so important to Habitat's model. But yet we'd love to have three homeowners be able to finish houses at the same time. And we don't quite have enough volunteer labor to do three all at once. This is a nice way to combine the two is we're going to get an insulated weather tight box from the factory in Vermont with the rough plumbing, electrical and mechanicals done but then our volunteers will do the flooring, the siding, the painting inside so that our future homeowners are engaged still in the construction of their homes, 
but they'll be able to do it all together, those three homeowners, um, as a team, which I think will be a nice way to build community for people who are gonna have to share a driveway uh, in the future and be, and be neighbors. Um, the, the folks in Vermont, um, I first heard about this program at the um, NESI, the Northeast Sustainable Energy Association's annual conference, and they really have uh, uh, a deeper understanding, I think, of some of these green building issues that I've seen elsewhere. They've been monitoring all the homes that they've built um, with moisture sensors and energy sensors and really looking at quality, durability. So if we're gonna go modular, we wanna do it in a way that's gonna provide long-term affordability for these homeowners and not have something that's gonna be in, uh, something that won't last and won't be affordable to live in. Um, the, because we're paying someone else to do some of the work, the construction cost is a little bit higher for us than uh, you, like you'll see in the Garfield Avenue budget. Um, but part of why we're able to consider that is um, we're, if, if this nonprofit in Vermont, if the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources grant comes through, that'll be $50,000 per unit to go towards the construction of these homes. Um, that is for us the go no go of whether or not we're going to try this strategy. Um, otherwise, we would rather take a little bit longer, figure out how to do it uh, the way we normally do without using modular. But the fifty thousand dollars per unit is what makes the modular viable. Um, we also have some other pending grant requests. Um, so. This, these homes would all be protected with a permanent deed restriction. We've already signed a regulatory agreement with the city of Northampton so that these units will be counted on the state's affordable housing inventory. Um, and if, if we also are trying a couple of new um, mortgage strategies with this, which is where we're going to, instead of Habitat providing the first the uh, mortgage for the homeowner, which is what we typically do. Um, we're going to partner with a local bank to provide a fixed rate 30 year mortgage on a portion of the prince of the sale price. And then we'll provide a deferred forgivable loan to make up the difference between the, what they can afford. So that allows us also to be able to do three projects at once because we don't have to do all of the financing ourselves, which is what we usually do. Questions? Yes. Um, Megan, thanks for, for coming in. Um, so you indicated that um, on this project there was sort of a, um, a reliance on, on uh, on the Vermont people getting the grant. Mm -hmm. what's, what's plan B? So plan B is to probably move to stick built rather than modular. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how that affects your decision making, but we have a long history of building the houses on site. While we would like to try this innovative new approach, we think that the responsible way to do that is if we can get some additional support and work with a partner that is experienced in doing it. But has to change the financing at your end? Um, we would look for um, reducing our overall construction budget. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Um, I'm just curious, um, and you may have stated this in the hearing, I don't recall. Um, Attracting uh, potential homeowners, how, how do you go about doing that? Sure. So, um, throughout the year, the years, I should say, we keep an ongoing notification list of people who are interested in a homeownership opportunity with us. Um, because, it, and that list is over 500 people on it right now. Oh. Um, and what then, there are people who express interest, they may not be qualified. Um, and then, before we start construction, um, we advertise that we have uh, an opportunity available and have information sessions to explain what the opportunity is that we're offering. People can ask questions. Um, and then we do a lottery based on 
uh, everyone who's eligible who applies. So we, use, we created a fair housing marketing plan that includes outreach to other community organizations. We really appreciate Valley CDC's home buyer education. So we often are sending people who are not quite ready uh, for home ownership to them for counseling. Um, we, so we distribute to other organizations in the housing field, to other social service agencies, social media. We put out a press release. We also call and notify people on this um, notification list who have expressed interest in the past. Um, if you want to tell someone, that'd be great. And, well, I mean, it's, it's largely a word of mouth, but it's by, through trying as many public channels as we can to get that word out and then providing an equal opportunity for people to apply so that they have a fair chance at having that opportunity to have a house. So would you weigh the eligibility of the applicant based on how many, uh, the, um, for three bedroom houses, I would assume, you're, you're, would you say it has to be more than just a one person, you know, or so, how would you do that? Yeah, so what we do is in the lottery, we give a preference for the household that could fill the house that we're building. So it's actually one of the reasons we're trying the small house with Garfield Avenue as well is because we found that those, while there's no rule against a single person getting a three bedroom, the likelihood is there's going to be someone else in the lottery who gets a preference who has a larger family. So the smaller the households that apply to us often don't get picked in the lottery because of that preference. So that's why we think it's nice to be able to build a diversity of housing sizes so that we can get those people who have smaller households to have an opportunity as well. But we also want the families to get households. So we've got the three bedrooms. We don't want to give up on that. Jeff, any other questions? Yeah, thank you. Um, so what, based on, on your presentation for Glendale, what, what would you say is the volunteer component of this project compared to the volunteer component of Garfield, given that you seem to be using a lot more contractors on this? So for Glendale, um, there would be a larger, Garfield would be the nearly, so all right, I gotta back up a little bit. Typically when we build a house, um, we have volunteers do all the framing, all the um, interior finishes, painting, installation of cabinets, um, but we hire contractors for things like excavation, um, electrical and plumbing, although for the electrical and plumbing, if we can, we try and work with the vocational high school, so Smith Vocational has done plumbing work for us in the past. Um, so anything that has a skilled trade or heavy equipment, we usually need to either hire or we have had electricians occasionally donate their time, but it's not something we can guarantee so Garfield Avenue would be that standard habitat model of trying to utilize as much volunteer labor as possible. Glendale Road, because what we're trying to do is do three houses in a shorter time period than we typically can do with volunteer labor. We'd be getting the boxes delivered from the factory weather tight. So all the insulation is done, the, um, it's all air sealed, the rough, the thing, everything that happens inside the walls has already happened. So then we're doing the things that are inside the volume of the building and putting on siding on the exterior. We'd be building a porch, so there'd still be some carpentry. We'd be um, working with local contractors on the excavation and um, connecting to utilities. Glendale Road requires a septic. There's town water, so we'd be hiring a contractor for septic. I haven't gotten volunteers who want to dig sleep fields. Um, <laughs> did you say that volunteers would be doing the porch? Or the, yeah, volunteers would do the porch. Yeah. Okay. And we would probably build um, a small, because these they wouldn't have basements, so we would build a small shed on site as well, which would be volunteer built, so they'd have somewhere to put their lawnmower, their bicycle, or their garbage cans. So say this project is, and I hope it is, fabulously successful and then and the finances all work great. Yeah. Um, do you see any conflict between this model, which is much more contractor heavy with, I mean, that, it, it, there's nothing bad about this project, fantastic, but it's yeah. it, what sets Habitat apart from a lot of the other affordable housing developers is, is the volunteer focus. So do you see that you might be moving away from that? 
Um, I don't see us moving. I mean, I think volunteers are sort of the heart and soul of what we do. Um, I think that it's looking at ways that we can um, best use those volunteers. Some of our volunteers are aging as well. So if there's a way to have, um, be able to accelerate some of our production, but still engage people in the process of construction, mm -hmm. that to me is sort of a win-win. Okay. So some of your volunteers are not aging. I think we all heard that. Oh, I, did, I slipped up that they are aging. Um, Jimmy Carter, yeah. And Jimmy Carter still goes out we, every year, does a work week. Um, but uh, Megan, what do you expect to hear on the uh, Department of Energy Um We had hoped maybe we would have heard already, because then I could have come in and uh, given you a nice, clean answer. Um, they. Uh, the Vermont nonprofit has been answering questions from the mess. I think they were the only applicant for the grant. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. Um, <laughs> so I, I think because they were really the pioneer of that program in Vermont, so it sort of makes sense to me. Um, uh, so I, I'm optimistic that we'll know this fall, but uh, if I say a date, then I'll be proven wrong. Uh, it's a state agency that has to decide. <laughs> okay, any other questions that anybody has? I, I just have one, just a, again, curiosity. So the, the modular, it, they're not former shipping containers, are they? They're, they are not. Okay. So these are, it's actually, it's kind of cool. They, the first, uh, they, their first uh, factory, it, they rented a old UPS warehouse, and they basically are stick building inside a house um, it, they put it up on lifts so they can insulate the bottom really well and get it all air seal tight. They they insulate in reverse. They they frame it. They put the sheetrock in and then they insulate from the outsides and then they put the she, um, sheathing on. So they have because they have that controlled environment, they are able to make them really really airtight. Um, and but it is uh, using you know typical framing lumber and materials. And they have also um, experiment. They've done some things with um, on the energy ventilation side that we haven't tried before. Um, and because they've been doing long-term monitoring in their other projects, and they also would provide us with uh, monitoring for these houses and follow-up um, inspections. Uh, they, they're providing some additional services and support as well. It comes in pieces. It would come in two boxes, because it's a first floor and a second floor, but part of trying to be efficient in the construction is it's just these two boxes that get connected. Anything else? All right, thank you very much. Um, thank you. I think you're aware that there's a public comment session in November 1st? Yep. So we're encouraged to have people here to speak if, if you would like. And I'm happy to answer any other questions. I think we're done with you for the moment. Thank All right. you. <laughs> and I think that means Rajna. You're up on Billy Till. Laura and I both went old school, so should I, should I shut this, Sarah? Sure. Boston 
um, in the mid 60s and we're here um, and so the, the Western Mass office was the first pod um, to, to virgin off of our Boston home um, but we've been developing owning and managing for over 50 years we've done it here um, in Northampton and at Village Hill um, and our last project here in the city was about 10 years ago now, and it was Hilltop, um, Hillside Place, excuse me, 40 units um, up at, up at uh, the Hospital Hill site. So um, some of our other work recently is, is on this board here, and I can certainly talk more about TCB and what we do. We, we are a nonprofit, we're mission driven. Um, we, um, in the past sort of five years, we've been doing more mixed income and mi mixed use projects. Um, so we're doing um, all of our uh, all of our work has an affordable component, but we're doing more market rate type housing. So that's um, a financial model that we're proposing for Village Hill now, which we're pretty excited about. And we we use a very similar model to um, finance this project over here, AO Flex, um, which is which was closed and in construction, and one of the first projects to use this sort of pilot um, workforce housing program that um, Mass Housing. A funding agency in Massachusetts um, has here. So, um, I, I've been at TCB and at Western Mass for over 10 years, um, and, and here in Northampton, if, if we're not offices as well. So, um, yeah, not that um, So, the project um, we are proposing here for you, um, I'm very excited about, is. Um, uh, really third phase for us um, at Village Hill. It is 65 units in two different buildings. Um, it is uh, the, the larger building up at the top here is, is um, 53 units. It's on about, it's developing on about five acres, but we will end up, um, mass development will convey 27 acres approximately to TCB. So I can talk a little bit more about uh, what's going on up here. Um, the other building is a 12 unit um, sort of infill lot closer to where we already are owning and managing um, some rental units here as well as here. Um, so in total, we have 73 units already um, operating up at Village Hill um, since the mid 2000s. Um, so We'll get into the deal more, but I just wanted to say a little bit about our team. So Valley CDC is, is our partner on this uh, project as well. Um, Berkshire Design Group, who uh, some of you may know, is a local civil and permitting engineer, but, um, engineering firm and very familiar with the site up there. Um, and Davis Square is our architect. So um, the, the unit mix, for the 65 units, it was a combination of um, studios up to three bedrooms. Majority of the units are ones and twos, um, and that's sort of where our, our you know, market research is showing us where, where the, um, the market demands are here. Um, the maybe we should build the large building. So this is sort of um, looking just at the 53 unit building. Um, and, and I'll just describe what's going on here with those other lots. So um, here, well, first of all, I think everyone knows Village Hill, right? So it's, it's, start, yeah, it's a 20 year story. So, um, but, but certainly, um, you know, started with some mixed income rental developed by TCB. Um, there's been some rental, Christopher Heights um, is a senior housing assisted living. But for the most part, this is sort of very high end home ownership. Um, and one of the, the goals of TCB and Valley CDC in, in pursuing a, a rental project again at this site was to kind of balance um, the, both, both the from home ownership and market um, of, of Village Hill, which we think sort of gets back to the original mission of the city in, in developing on this site, and also a bit of the affordability scales here because we do have you know, this market that is taken off up there. Um, we, you know, a, a bit had to overcome initially the original vision for this back site in particular, which um, had, a, had a developer previously that um, was not able to put things together. 
Um, and it was for you know more estate lots um, and, and probably more sort of high high end billion dollar homes. So this is very different, both in physical form as well as you know what it is. Um, it is uh, dense, so we've gotten 53 units and five acres, so just about 10, 11 units an acre. Um, we've got a, that density allows us to have a significant amount of open space um, as an amenity, not only for the building and the residents, both buildings and all all GCB buildings, but really also for the whole site. Um, and we're really excited about that and, and for the city. Um, so we have you know, this this lovely playground. We've been um, uh, really designing along with um, some, some neighborhood, the, the neighborhood group up at Village Hill. Um, I was very excited about this, this playground here. Um, as well as, you know, flat lawn area. So they do have a park up there, but they don't have sort of a lawn um, for soccer games and whatnot. So that, this is a nice uh, amenity um, we're really excited about. The open space um, is complemented by some of these, you know, existing trail networks up there at Village Hill. And, and this is an existing trail um, that um, we will also connect to and improve in certain sections. And then here's, you know, there's other trail systems. Here is one that we will also kind of tie into the through the ground and back out into the natural kind of trail system network. So that's that's pretty exciting. Um, the the rear part of the of this particular lot will have again, as I said, um, at least 20 acres probably deeded back to the city for conservation land. Um, down at the, the southern part of our site, um, these will become probably five single family lots that mass development will sell off as they have um, the other portions of this site to a builder for development. Part of the idea there was to create a transition from the homeownership that's here in the sort of lower density form up to the, this building. It, it looks bigger than it is, and we'll show you the rendering. It's really just two and a half stories, and kind of um, the, the distance between here with the um, with the open space means that you know visually, when you're over here on Fort Crossing, you're not kind of looking up at this very large structure. So, um, but but that was part of the idea of creating this um, this transition place here, and then over here. Um, we understand that there's a co-housing group um, who's working with a developer to build um, a co-housing development over there on the uh, east side of the property line. This over here is, is a continuation of Pequoy and is under construction. Um, then we have our smaller building, um, uh, which is not too overlooked. Quite lovely. It's um, it's 12 units. It is you know, TCB um, it, uh, is you know, we have this building that's been operating um, for a while, and then this as well. So this to us felt that this was always a site we wanted to develop on. Um, Mass development has had it out sort of for sale, right? Um, but it, it, we needed um, another we needed another parcel in order to create the, the kind of financing scale to be able to to, to take this on. So this is twelve units, uh, zeros and, and ones, two and ones. It's got third floor, um, about eleven eleven hundred square feet of commercial space. Um, as well as new new uh, offices for the community builders management, and so I will move into. Um, so uh, yeah, and we're excited to show you what these look like. So we should just do the rendering. Um, so here we have our two buildings. Um, this is the, the L-shaped building in the back. That's fifty three units, um, and this is our twelve unit. Um, and, and because it's infill and it's sort of closer to the front of the site and it's surrounded by a lot of masonry and, and, and this is a rehab over here of a nurse's dorm, you know, we tried to sort of have it blend in with some of the surrounding buildings, it's sort of blending um, com commercially, commercial first floor building. This, I think we're settling on the ski lodge. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and you can see that it's, it really is two and a half stories. That third, third story is tucked into the attic. Um, but but you know, full array of units up there 
Um, for the most part, no slab on grade. There is a partial um, basement in the corner of the elbow of the L um, for um, maintenance um, and storage. So, any questions about the building or the site or the design? Or um, Actually, I do have a question. Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious about how parking is going to be accommodated for these two. Sure. Um, so um, slightly differently for each. The 12 unit built building up at the front, we were, we're behind on naming. Um, uh, the parking for this building has already been calculated and programmed into the existing parking already built here, um, which for the most part serves uh, the residents of these two TCB buildings. So that's, you know, that's how that works. It's, um, there's overflow parking um, already there. And then the larger building, um, we've got about um, slightly over 30 spaces back here and another 27 here on, um, you know, the, the extension of Olander Drive. Um, so in total, it's about 60, a little over 60 spaces for a 53-unit building, um, which you know we think is more than adequate um, to serve the needs of the residents in that building based on our, the parking ratios we have already up there at the site, and keeping in mind that we're serving a, a more of a market. Um, so in that sense, they may have some more cars, but we still think, you know, it's it's tough to predict, but um, this is you know. Uh, we're likely to get, you know, because smaller units, right, zeros and ones, we're likely to get smaller households, fewer cars, people who want to bike. And then, of course, there's lots of overflow parking already at Village Hill. So part of the reason for, you know, um, the parking at Olander Drive extension is also as a traffic calming measure. It matches um, some of the, you know, parking concepts on the, on the roads already up there.